We are back talking vintage sports from Needix at the Old Garden on 48th Street. It isn't there anymore. Needix isn't there anymore. Our memories are still here. How Bach, how are you? You're one of the returning regulars, co host How you doing? I'm fine. I'm good. To, glad, glad to talk to you guys. Good. We enjoy it on a weekly basis. Um, George Case the Third is here. How are you, sir? I'm just fine, and good to talk to you as always, Ralph. And and how I always enjoy talking to you as well. Good. This has been fun for uh, for me over the the weeks, and uh, y- you know, basically my um, my network is mostly baseball. We do talk other sports on this particular show, but we all come full circle. Our first love is baseball, and um, our guest today is a returnee to the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network Airwaves. He wrote one of the most fascinating books um, of the last year, easily, and a book that calls called my attention to a big inequity in baseball. Things are just not fair in the Players Union, and I'd like to welcome back uh, to Comfortably Zone, first time on this particular show, Doug Gladstone. How are you, sir? I'm very well, Ralph. Thank you uh, kindly for having me back. I have one make, want to make one correction. Um, the book came out, uh, oh, it's been out since uh, April of uh, 2010. So I don't want anyone oh. to think that, you know, um, the book is... Well, I'll tell you what fooled you know. me. You did an interview with Ian Kahanowitz on this network. I did that, indeed. That um, was terrific, and it called my attention to it. Um, the book basically is a is a cup, a bitter cup of coffee written about um, players who came up for a short period of time Some made a contribution, some not, and you went back and talked to a bunch of folks. Um, Incredibly interesting. Interesting story. I I thank you, and Uh, if if you don't mind, um, I would like to put a question to one of your other guests, uh, Mr. Case, um, whose father, of course, was a four-time All-Star. Yes, he was. You know, quite uh, quite a ball player possess a lot of speed. Um, your father, correct me if I'm wrong, did not live to see the day when the pre-1947 players were awarded between $7,500 and $10,000 a year. Uh, is that no, he, uh, Doug, he was not. Uh, my dad did make the pension by one year because he retired in 1947, but, but he had passed away you know, after they had the increase. So, you know, he did uh, get a nice pension because he, he retired in 47. He was covered. And I was going to ask you a question because I was wondering myself, you know, where that 1947 date came from, how that was uh, determined because I was very curious. My dad was was told, I guess, a year before he retired that if he stayed one more year as an active player, he would qualify for the pension. And then there was an increase. I know early Wynn had been uh, lobbying for an increase, but – Nowhere near the the payout that the the players got later on. Uh, the the um, the players union, uh, essentially the players pension fund rather, was established. No fooling on uh, on April first, nineteen forty seven. And at that point in time, you needed uh, to be um, playing for five years, and then the threshold in 1969 was lowered to four years, and then, of course, in 1980, it was lowered to the ridiculous uh, one-game day for um, health coverage and 43 game days of credit for, right. a, uh, for, for a pension allowance. So the very fact that your father um, was able, I mean, you know, I really thought, your answer was going to be no, no, he didn't get one, but you're telling me he did. So I'm just as no, he did. I mean, it was minimal. It, it was minimal, Doug. It had yeah. nothing to, you know, it doesn't compare to what 
what's going on now, but he did retire in 47, so he was, mm. you know, credited for 10 years of service prior to that because he he broke in in 1937. So, you know, he did receive a small pension, and then I do remember that uh, my mom and dad were very happy. They got a letter from Early Win, and Early had, had lobbied, I guess, with the Players Union and was able to get an increase. So he did receive an increase. I think it was almost twice what he was getting, but it was still minimal compared to you know what they're getting today. But but he did benefit to a degree from the the pension program, and if that if the Players Association or whatever it was established 1947 as the date, then then that's where that day came from. Well, you know, he's not here. I don't know whether Mom's still alive. Uh, he's not here to um, to tell us, obviously. Um, yeah. what, what occurred, but uh, well, I'm only say, saying it's you know as, as what he told me. My mother passed sure. away, uh, but she you know she was the beneficiary of, right. of my dad's pension until she died. Uh, but but he did receive a pension. But as I said, you know compared to the the pension that the players have today, as you've outlined in your book and and some other people that I've talked to, I mean it's minuscule compared to the pension plan that they have in force today. Well, free agency has a lot to do with that, and to be yes, fair, it sure I, does. I, I, I never like to give the Players Union, particularly Don Fair, too much credit, but let's face it, I mean, he um, he did negotiate very well on behalf of, um, of his membership, and um, I think that's why he was voted his $19 million uh, going away swan song present when he retired. Um, a few years ago, me, I would have been happy with a gold watch, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that's what, that's what Curtis Granderson and, um, and the Players Union, um, representatives, uh, five, six years ago before he became executive director of the NHL Players Union, uh, right. voted him. So Godspeed, you know what? Well, listen, I, I, I want everyone uh, on the Comfortably Zone network to understand one thing about me. I do not begrudge anyone making the monies that they are receiving. I think they're totally obscene, um, but, you know, with the respective rises in final average salaries um, and, and minimum um, salaries, I think the, the 25th man who rides the, who rides the pines is going to get um, five hundred and thirty five thousand dollars beginning in uh two thousand and nineteen and the average uh salary is is four point four million dollars i don't begrudge anyone th- making that money to just tell you the kind of truth i'm i'm very envious of it but let's let's be real the men that i wrote about the 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 um david Clydes and the carmen fanzones they're the ones who helped usher in free agency by standing on picket lines, by going out on strike, by enduring labor stoppages. And I just think that to have this bone uh, be thrown at them in April 2011, uh, it, it's a form of reparations. You know what, Doug, I have to say I agree with you. And, and if I were playing, I've said this to many people, if I were playing today, and with the contract and the monies they have, I, I, I'd simply say, hey, where do I sign? I mean, it, I don't begrudge them either. I mean, my dad was a player, loved the game, but the money that he made was so small. But on the other hand, even before, you know, your book, there's players that retired like in 45, 46 or whatever that they really needed money and they got nothing. So sure. I, I understand the, the situation that you're talking about, but there was also – you know, a big problem as far as I'm concerned with players early on, some great Hall of Famers like uh, Jimmy Fox and Lefty Grove and, and Hack Wilson, those players, you know, all Hall of Famers but never made really any money, and yet they retired before 1947, so they received absolutely zero in pension. Well, I, I've told this story before on Ralph's program um, that Dolph Camilli, the 1941 NL MVP, Basically, he said, well, what, what's going on here? Are you telling me that my contributions to the game, just because I played prior to April of 1947, um, doesn't mean anything? And right. that's why um, in 1997, 
Mr. Camilli and uh, Pete Coscarot, the old Brooklyn Dodger, and um, Al Gianfrido, they all received monies. Um, that's why, it, for the life of me, it, it, I, I can never understand why, and Ralph has read so many of my press releases, why the, the league and the union are insisting on this ridiculous actuarial computation of, of, of 43 game days equaling one quarter up to 16 quarters or $10,000. Uh, Dolph Camilli just got a straight, you know, seventy five hundred, ten thousand dollars a year. The the Negro League veterans who didn't even have an employment contractual relationship with the game. Um, in in two thousand and three, they were awarded forty thousand dollars for four years or three hundred and fifty dollars a month for life. In nineteen ninety seven. Um, they were given seventy five hundred to ten thousand dollars, and then what burns my bridges? Um, look, let's face it: uh, the the color of of my skin, your skin, you know, it wouldn't preclude us from playing um, baseball. The institutional racism of the sport mirrored um, societies. Uh, but how can you give health insurance benefits in nineteen ninety three to Negro League veterans? And not give comparable or or better benefits to the the pre 1980 um, players. It defies logic, and that's why I'm on what Ralph you know has called before this crusade. Right. No, it's very. Well, I call it a, a, a crusade. I'm going to be very interested to hear you know all these things because the pension plan, obviously, you know, I, I had a direct connection to it because of my dad, but but. You know, I, I look at it today and I say, oh, my God, these players are going to have a tremendous, you know, pension and the benefits and all that. But there are, as you said, Doug, there, there are a lot of players that are being left out. I think that's right. a function. And there's of the money. It's any money allotted to these players would not come out of the, the existing player's pocket. There's an incredible amount of money. Doug Fear gets $19 million as a going away present. Half of that money could, could have been put in a trust for these, these players and could have taken care of all of it. And I don't think Doug Fear could have complained at getting $8 million, or not, if you know what I'm saying. He would have been just very happy. And it's not a matter of there not being a, enough money. They're generous with their with their own. Why not be generous with players that just didn't make that four year cut? And um, if you could take care of the old Negro League players, which is fair, they were um, deprived of playing a game that they loved just simply because of the color of their skin, which is uh, abominable. They should. Be, Things should be evened out for forever, but why at the expense? And it's not even at the expense of these 500 some odd players who are um, still uh, still with us, and um, many of them indigent. Many of them could use a supplement. Many of them would just like to see some fairness. Um, Without putting, without, putting Hal, without putting Hal on the spot, uh, and I'm not attempting to be adversarial, but, uh, you know, Ronald Bloom, he, your old colleague here in New York, he won't cover this. He won't touch it. Um, was this on your radar, uh, Hal, when, when you uh, were with the yeah, AT? The, the answer to your question is no. I was unaware of how unfair this system ha is and has become. Uh, Ron, Ron Blum uh, takes care of all, or took care of all financial issues when I was at the AP uh, in, in baseball, and we were happy to let him do it because uh, the baseball writers, like myself, were hits, runs, and errors guys, and, and we loved the game, obviously, but we really weren't too interested in the dollars and cents. Oh, sure, it turned our heads, for example, when – when Nolan Ryan became the first million-dollar player, wow, a million-dollar player. But, boy, did he throw a fastball, and, boy, did he have a, a hook. 
You know, he, uh, he was a great player, a great pitcher. And that was what concerned us. Uh, what you're talking about really was left to his belly, to Blum's belly, and I don't understand why he wouldn't jump right into it because it's it's outrageous, frankly. Because these are names of players who are very familiar to me. I wrote about these guys because I started writing baseball in 1963, and and guys like David Clyde, who I think was a number one draft choice, uh, I wrote about these, these players. Correct. You know, and, and so you don't think I didn't think that. I mean, I knew he hurt his arm, and he had a he had a shortened career, and it was unfortunate. And we move on. And you always think, well, you get a pension, I get a pension. I'm sure he gets a pension, but apparently that's not the case, and that's very very disturbing. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. I really couldn't. Yeah. Where does it go from here? What can we do to bring attention? Uh, I was thinking it would be great to get some sort of campaign going to with the fans who um, really grow up idolizing these players, you know, with baseball cards, this, that, and the other thing. We're very appreciative as fans for the memories. If you're just leaving it at that, if the fans could get together and not buy the merchandise, the caps, the shirts that go where proceeds go towards the Major League Players Association, it's not a union, it's an, an association, and if they could just withhold buying the, as my father would say, the chazerai, the junk, you know, you go, you you buy the crap. They, they they change the uniforms every fifteen minutes, and you buy new uniforms. Change the cap style, and this and that. Billions, of millions of dollars are being being made, and it, it's in addition to their the players' salaries. It's a, it's an ungodly amount of money. They deserve it. Let them have it after they take care of the players that they vote to take care of the players that are without pension. And well, well Ralph, as, as you and I both know, crap, sorry, we can go ahead. get a little campaign going, and that will call the players, if, if people aren't buying the merchandise, they're not getting the, um, the bucks for it. Um, that would call their attention to it really quickly. And... Um, the small amount of money that the union would have to give up doesn't come out of anybody's pocket. That's what calls me. Why would a player, a human being, who would say, well, you know, how about this guy Fowler who came up one inning? He smacked into a wall. He may never come back. He played one inning. He gets a lifetime's worth of medical coverage. Today. Here's the thing, Ralph, if I could. Um, the, and I believe we discussed this on, um, on, on Peter Golombach. Yeah, correct. Um, that the, the charitable donations of health insurance um, and, and monthly allowances to the Negro League players were just that, charity. Um, MLB can write that off at the end of the year. But um, the monies that are paying the uh, pre-1980 players, uh, the $625 a quarter for every quarter up to 16 quarters or $10,000. And by the way, none, none of these guys. There's only one man who even remotely comes close to that yardstick, and, and he's 80 years young uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, Don Dillard, the former uh, pinch hitter extraordinaire for the uh, – Milwaukee Cardinals. Braves and Cleveland Indians. Oh, was he a Cardinal yeah, too? I think Cardinals I, I, for a while, if I'm not mistaken. A, anyway, the money anyway. paying the Dillards and the Clydes and, and the fan zones and the Stork Theodores of the world, that's coming out of the competitive balance tax, a.k.a. the, the, uh, the euphemistically known as the Steinbrenner luxury tax. So that's why I, 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 would, I would bet the farm that Tony Clark doesn't want, you know, to, to divvy up any more of the pie. You take money out of the competitive balance tax, 
um, it's going to hurt not only in the league, but it's going to hurt the union. What I have started to do, um, and, and just parenthetically, Ralph knows this. I don't know if if, um, if you other gentlemen know this. On September 8th, do you know Major League Baseball made a $10 million donation to the Hall of Fame? They made a whole of they made a ten million dollar donation to the Hall of Fame. You know, essentially they're cho- they're choosing museum relics over retirees. They're 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 choosing the two point eight million dollar T two hundred six card of Honus Wagner over David Clyde. Um, what I would like to see happen, and George, um, and, and and I don't believe George. Or, or Mr. Bach knows this, but I'd like to see the antitrust exemption go by the wayside. You know, for 95 years, uh, apparently Congress and the Supreme Court have thought baseball just to be an exhibition, uh, a mere amusement. Well, you know, <laughs> the, the average team is worth, I think, one9 Billion dollars, and that's up sixteen. It's it's definitely big business. It's, it's, is that uh, they, uh, Doug? What you're saying, and and that would that apply? I mean, if they say baseball is entertainment, not a business, so so what's the movie industry? That's entertainment. I mean, they don't have an antitrust exemption. Uh, you know, I don't I don't believe so. But I mean, baseball is, as you say, is big business. I mean, it's it's a billion dollar plus business. For you know, for what it is today, with with players making ten million, twenty million, you know, one hundred and twenty-five sure. million ten-year. Contract. You and I know that. You and I know that. But try to convince the people. Um, I think the the last time the House Judiciary Committee passed a bill to revoke the exemption uh, was in 1994, and it was never sent to the full House of Representatives. Now. Um, you know, if Ralph, if you're listeners out there, and Hal, by the way, if you want to come out of retirement and do a story, um, <laughs> believe me, I'll be more than happy to give you names and contact information for the Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial and Antitrust Law, because they would be the ones, they would be the body to hear testimony uh, about any new proposed legislation. And quite frankly, I don't want to call it blackmail, but I think. I'll call it leverage. I'd like to leverage the antitrust exemption being taken away from MLB. And I bet you, Rob Manfred, who, by the way, you know, I I think he's a very fair person. I've spoken to him. He's answered my emails. He and Pat Courtney, the, the, the press spokesperson for MLB, they're gentlemen, or, or as Ralph would say, they're menches. Okay, um, I can't say that for for Tony Clark and and Steve Rogers. I, I really can't. Uh, okay, you send, let me you clarify Tony one Clark, thing. You send, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say that the money that the Players Association or baseball uh, combined gives to the Hall of Fame should have no part of this argument. Because that's not taking – they could give to the Hall of Fame and they can take care of their own, of their own fellow human beings. And it does – it comes down to simply it's not fair. It's not fair to take care of the Negro League players and not the players that played in in big big league ball. I mean, there's so many names that we recognize – I don't think Nippy Jones was up, for, for instance, uh, for four, four years. I don't think that um, uh, you mentioned David Klein, um, Kuno Barrigan from Sacramento. Right. Um, he was a cub, he, um, cub catcher and just barely missed qualifying for the pension. And at this point... Um, Fair is fair. They didn't at that time when they set the four year mark. They had no idea how much money would be coming in in the future. How what a boom it was for the union or the association, which is they argue with 
baseball, they're not the foe of baseball. They work hand in hand. Um, it's um, th- that's uh, that's to be said. Um, I, you know, I can't you know, think of that I mean, word. Yeah, they collude. <laughs> it's collusion is what what I'm looking for. Um, they watch you know, watch each other's backs. And, you know where uh, all this started. The, uh, there was no union for a hundred years, and then uh, Ralph Kiner, the late Ralph Kiner, Hall of Famer, the late Robin Roberts, Hall of Famer, got together and they started the union and they went and they hired Marvin Miller. Now Marvin Miller was a terrific guy, uh, wonderful with the press, wonderful with everybody, but he was all for the current players, and that's why they loved him. They, As he well, had he no should concern. Be. How? As well, they should be. The first job of a labor economist is to support and go to bat, no pun intended, for their current membership. Sure, but the game was built on the shoulders of players like George Case's father and his his entire community of players, both at his time and before him. Baseball is built on history. The, The statistics are all history. And to ignore the history and to ignore the players who wrote that history is scandalous. And Marvin Miller turned his back on everything before he came along, which was in 1980, I guess, or thereabouts. And he staged strikes. We had several player stoppages, which I covered. And it was all about the current generation of players. Uh, what about the alumni? We're not the alumni. We don't care about the alumni. We worry about the players who are playing the game today. And that's let me tell wrong. You something. That's flat let me out tell you wrong. Something. Hal, let me tell you something about the Alumni Association in Colorado Springs. Dan Foster and Jeff Hickson are, um, I don't want to slander anybody, but basically uh, Dan Foster worked for MLB Advanced Media. So you know he's not um, going to do anything on behalf of, of alumni. Uh, this is a group that cares more about putting on golf outings and staging youth clinics. And like, and, and I have always said, you know, the future generation, I'm a parent, all right, my little one, uh, she can't turn two yet, but, uh, you know, she, she, can, she can hit a wiffle ball off my chest and, and leave an imprint. Um, all I'm trying to say is we care a lot about the future generation, and rightly so, but like Hal just said, let's have a little healthy respect for the men who grew the game. And I just want to add one thing, um, and then I'll let you, you fellows weigh in. Um, I got the privilege and pleasure of speaking to, to the late Marvin Miller on Veterans Day, um, November 11, 2009. I'll never forget it. Uh, and he couldn't have been more gracious, and he couldn't have been more hospitable. And you know what he told me? He said, ruefully, um, if I had to do it all over again, of course I would have insisted on retroactivity for these pre-1980 players. Right there and then. Now, he's not here to defend himself, um, obviously, but right there, the, the, the guy who really built the modern Players Association slash Union, even he expressed remorse. You know, that's very interesting you said that, Doug. I mean, I I didn't know Marvin Miller. I've never met him. You know, I know my dad probably met him because I think he used to go around uh, and have meetings and stuff. But but I think it's very interesting, you know, and I agree with Hal and and Ralph. and, And when I look back at it, and from a selfish point of view, you know, my dad, I mean, he wasn't a superstar, but a lot of the guys were superstars. And if they retired before that cutoff date, they got absolutely nothing. And they certainly built, you know, the popularity of the game by who they were. And, uh, you know, today I can understand. I mean, now you got Tony Clark uh, as the head of the, the Union uh, Players Association. Tony Clark's a former player. Who's he going to side with? He's going to side with the current group of players. And the alumni organization that you're talking about, and I've had some dealings with them, I mean, they're basically a marketing arm. I mean, they, they do marketing, and you're saying, you know, golf tournaments and, and various events and that kind of thing. You know, they are a separate organization from the Players Union, and basically they're in, what, Colorado Springs, I think, and they are a marketing organization 
rather than a players' uh, uh, union. Yeah, they don't know what advocacy is. They wouldn't know. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorite movies, Bang the Drum Slowly, with Moriarty and De Niro. They wouldn't know how to bang a drum if, if they gave if they gave one to them. <laughs> Boy, what a terrific trilogy that was. Um, bang the drum slowly. The seam, seamstress, seam something. Um, and anyway, uh, I can't think of the author right now, but that was a great, great book indeed. Um, who well, Mark are... Mark Harris, Mark Harris. Do you have any... Mark yeah, Harris, Mark correct. Harris, exactly, exactly. Good memory, good memory. Um, who are your allies in this, Doug? Who who was uh, who do you find is jumping on on this? <laughs> well, in terms of in terms of current columnists, not too many. You know, I'll I'll tell your audience right here, right now. I don't think I mentioned it on Peter's show. I mean, Peter is a very big supporter. I'd like to believe George Case and Hal Bach are now supporters. Ralph Tycho is a supporter. I'll tell you who's not a supporter. A man named Harold Reynolds. Harold Reynolds has had multiple platforms with ESPN, Fox, now MLB Network. Do you know who Harold, Harold Reynolds' older brother is? Don Reynolds. Don Reynolds was a great star in, um, in Oregon, and he played two years with uh, with the San Diego Padres. Do you know Don Reynolds doesn't get a pension? And Harold Reynolds has had multiple times to go to bat for his sibling, and he doesn't. That's what we're, I'm dealing with, the reluctance of, of today's sports columnists or journalists. You know, Hal, I don't know what it is. Are people afraid that if they they write a story like this, you know, they're going to lose their precious contacts with MLB or they're going to lose their precious entree to to the chicken uh, meal that, that, you know, that, that is put out in, in the clubhouse for them? I access am, means an awful lot, Doug. Access means an awful lot. And if they cut off the access, uh, writers are in trouble, frankly. And I know writers who've had the access cut off, so I can tell you that firsthand. Um, but you have to have the courage of your convictions, and you have to be, you have to move ahead and, and write what's right, what, what's correct. And certainly you're preaching to the choir, Hal. I agree with you. I know, I know. But uh, that's the answer uh, to your question. Why aren't they? Why aren't they written about? Why isn't this written about? I think that in large measure. Uh, writers are concerned about their access and being part of the fraternity. Baseball is a fraternity, and it's very tough to get into that fraternity. And if you get thrown out of that fraternity, you'll never get back in. So Let me ask you this. You're, you're, yes. you're a, a former AP, a revered AP. I'm not trying to be a sycophant. I don't know you from Adam. I'm not trying to suck up to you. You are a, a, a very, very smart guy who's been around. How come all these writers jump on the the, the uh, PED um, bandwagon, performance enhancing drugs? They write about that. They're not afraid to write about that. Yet pensions, pensions, which pretty much everybody, you know, uh, in 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 the world can identify with. Not many people can identify with PEDs, but they won't write about. PED, they won't write about pensions. Um, they'll you they'll write think. about PEDs. Go ahead. Two things. I think that uh, my view of PEDs, and when I was voting for the Hall of Fame and, and when I was an active writer, uh, my view of PD, PEDs was you're cheating the sport. You're cheating the sport if you use a, a performance-enhancing drug, and that's not acceptable to me. Now, pensions, well, everybody gets a pension. What do you, of course they get pensions. And that, let's move on. How many hits, runs, and errors did you have? But the, clearly, that's not the case. Everybody doesn't get pensions. And I don't think the writers know that. I frankly don't think, certainly my generation of writers, I'm sure, didn't know that. Now, the writers today are a little more investigative uh, and perhaps 
perhaps they know it, but I don't know why they wouldn't write it. I mean, it's it's a scandal. That's what it, I mean. Uh, Thank you. In the very beginning of our conversation, it's a scandal to not take care. Jimmy Fox didn't get a pension. Are you kidding me? Did yeah, Carl Hubble Grove didn't get a Carl pension? Hubble was one of those. Of course, who he didn't got a pension. pension. He had to get a pension. He yeah. was the greatest, one of the greatest left-handed pitchers in the history of our game. How could he not have had a pension? But he didn't, and nope. nobody knows it. No, he didn't, Hal. And, and I mean, I only know I only know it because of my dad being a player, and I know what the deal was when the players and and, and Grove and Fox and and those guys they were good friends of my dad. So I know that they didn't get a pension, and some of them really could have used the money uh, because they had none. And, and the amount of money they were making as a player. I mean, I looked at some salaries. I mean, guys like Lefty Grove or Jimmy Fox. I mean, they were making thirty-five, forty thousand dollars a year compared to today's players that are making ten million a year. And they're only too happy to trot these guys out on old timers' days, right? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. Let me ask everybody: If Major League Baseball and the union got together and said we're going to take care of five hundred players, and they announced it. Would that not be a beautiful public relations uh, thing? Look, that would engender a lot of great will, a lot of goodwill. Exactly, much more goodwill than than the money. In other words, um, they get more out of it back just just by saying, you know, we negotiate for, with each other. For the, to help each other, and we're making so much money, nobody dreamt uh, we make so, so much money, and we're looked at as a bunch of money-hungry players and owners both, and hated by, by the fans uh, for the financial stuff. Boy, that would be a boom. They just say, they say, Listen, oh, Ralph, I'm, I'm just, I, I, I human only... Beings. Maybe these are human beings. That's I'm all. only trying, I figured a, a very nice way to start. George Hal, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, that, that bone that was thrown these guys back in April 2011, it right. can't be passed on to a widow or a surviving spouse or a family member or any designated beneficiary. So when when Carmen passes on, and I hope that doesn't happen for a very long time, when David passes on, the payment dies with them. So I, I did not I'm know just God, I did not know that at all. Well, it uh, does. Yeah. Well, cuz I know when my, you know, when my dad died, I mean, as I said the pension was a lot less than that, but but I know my mother received the But your mom got this. something, George. That's exactly. Right. And she did until she died and then, you know, that was it. But but the benefit that she received was was based upon my dad's pension when, you know, when as a player. Now, Sue Rainey, who is Carmen's bride, will get squat. David Clyde's four children will get nothing. Uh, George Theodore's wife or son will get nothing. Um, Jimmy Hutto's two daughters uh, will get nothing. And Jimmy Hutto, who has had every sort of injury plague him throughout his career, I don't know, uh, if you fellows remember him, he had a cup of coffee. That's why my book is named what it's named. Um, with, with the Phillies and the Baltimore Orioles, Jimmy has had more back and leg surgeries uh, than, than any person I've ever known. And he almost died of an aneurysm. He was a catcher, first baseman, outfielder. He, his doctors said he almost died of an aneurysm from all the home plate collisions that he was involved with. And, Ralph, yes, they're people, but they're not people to the league and the union. They're people, they're, they're, they're playthings that you can toy with. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. That's a very sad story, uh, Doug. I, I did not know that, and, uh, you know, that sort of, you know, really shocks me that the coldness of, of the game, uh, you know, would allow something like that to happen. A player like that should certainly have some, some medical benefit uh, based upon his uh, you know, time and, and, and injuries that occurred from, from his profession. George, I'm yep. just trying to get the word out, and it is a uphill battle. And I've been at this gentleman for a very long time, for seven years. 
And every time I think I see a light at the end of the tunnel, that tunnel shuts. Yeah. Mm. I remember well, good I spoke luck, with, uh, good luck with it, Doug. I, I mean, you're bringing up some things that I didn't know about, and I wish you well. And and certainly, you know, I I only have contacts because of my dad being a player and, and with other players. But uh, some of the powers that be, with whether it be Major League Baseball or the Players Union or whatever, should so certainly uh, listen to what you're saying because I think it has tremendous merit. A columnist. Doug, the is there a possibility of a class what? action suit? I'm going to say this like I told you and Peter uh, on that program we recorded last month. We have a lot of interest among lawyers who are willing to take this on um, based on employment law. Uh, If you recall, gentlemen, the 2003 class action lawsuit that, that, you know, was a ridiculous thing to, to even attempt to litigate because... Um, because the lawyers uh, representing the, the, the three chief litigants um, try to cry reverse discrimination. Well, that's ridiculous because a lot of the pre-1980 players um, are persons of color or African Americans, like Bill Murphy of the Mets, um, or most famously, and he doesn't need the money, Herb Washington, the designated pinch hitter deluxe of the of the, so the A's, yes. Athletic. One of right. Charlie Finley's um, uh, moves. Yeah, the designated <laughs> runner, right? He never got in that bat, but he was on base all the time. He scored he 37 was. runs without getting in that bat. Right. Oh. <laughs> and uh, he gets no pension. Yeah, but, but you know what? He's got a string of McDonald's franchises in Cleveland. He really doesn't need it, but that's besides the point. That's besides the point. Um, Who is your biggest foe? I asked you who your biggest ally was, and you don't have many. And that's where um, you're doing a little Don Quixote blowing at windmills. uh, I'll bet you think, think of it that way once in a while. Who's your biggest foe? Is it Clark? I I started to say... I started to say that a Pittsburgh um, Post-Gazette columnist uh, told me that Steve Rogers, the player's liaison uh, for pension matters to Tony Clark, called me, not on the record, because God forbid he should actually comment on the record, but he called me a big thorn in the union side. Well, you know what? I wear that with a badge of honor. I, I wear that as a badge of honor. I've been called a troublemaker, an instigator, an agitator. And you know what? This country was founded by agitators. So I don't yeah. mind that. But it's, it's Steve Rogers, I think, whispering into Tony Clark's ears. Whoa. Okay. That, oh. uh, you identify who you have to come up against. Can they be can they be talked to? Could you? Is there a way that maybe you could sit down with Steve Rogers? And I would I welcome that opportunity. I would welcome, and I tried this when I first started publicizing my book. I said I'll go on the MLB Network. I'll have a frank one-on-one conversation with at the time the late Michael Weiner, who succumbed to brain cancer. I'll go on with anyone in the MLB Network. Um, and if anyone's listening uh, out there, go ahead. I throw down the gauntlet of challenge, and I, I will go on your program, okay? But no one wants to go take me up on the offer. Mm. You can't. You send certified return receipt requested packages to the players' union. Nothing. No response. Do they accept? Do they accept the res- the package? Yes. Do they they sign for it? So you know they're getting. It. Yes. Yes. And they don't have the courtesy of at least responding That's and That's saying correct. this is the way this is the way the system is. Blah blah blah. And here's why. Blah, blah, blah. At least respond to you, and you have something to talk about. See, because if you, if you're not talking, 
and it, this runs in anything, in marriage, in relationships, and in business, you've got to talk. You've got to keep the lines of communication open at all times. And, um, and but, you know, it, also, it's more than that. that issue. It's just doing the right it's thing. It. It's as simple as that. Do the right yeah. thing. I was always taught by my parents, do the right thing. And the right, right. thing is to take care of the players who built this game to what it is today. Uh, maybe maybe they're maybe they're forgotten because they played in the in the 30s and the 40s and, and the 20s and in that era, but they're not forgotten by people who are students of the game, uh, like I am and like George is and like Ralph is. Uh, th- these are the people who built the game, who made the game uh, the national pastime and the most popular game in our country. Now, sure, football has overtaken it, and that's fine for the football players who all have concussions, but. For me, baseball has been and always will be number one. And the reason it's number one is it's got these great heroes of the past, great names that you can read about in books. And and it's just, it's very, very it's like your own. It's a well-storied game. It's a, it is. a game that it is fun to write about. It's fun to, fun to discuss. Fun to write about. Yeah, yeah. it's, 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 and a, great, it's, it's also, a great game. It's a great game to to talk about, to to write about, to play. I mean, it, it's it's just wonderful, and it's built on tradition. And what Doug is pointing out is that you know, so what? The tradition, you know, they don't care about the tradition because it's not putting people in the seats, or or it's not paying the, the current guy ten million dollars a year. But the guys who built the game, as you fellows are talking about, you know, they they get nothing, and, and they're sort of forgotten. And so I agree. I mean, uh, I love baseball history, and that's part of what I do. But the fact is that I'm aware of those great players. And I, I pointed out when, when you have some of the greatest players of all time that have received absolutely no pension, and some of them were destitute, and, and the fact is that they could certainly have benefited by, by some increases or, or some allowances uh, to, from their playing days, but they got nothing. And I think it's a sad, and a sad thing. And, and Doug, I wish you well. I think you've you've raised a very good point, and uh, and I hope something can come of it. Well, thank you. Hey, George. Doug, we're going to continue to magnify this on a regular basis. We're going to have um, you were nice enough to give me some names and numbers that, of players that we're going to have on the network in the up, on upcoming shows, and just keep hammering away and just. Um, let people know and um, passing the word and all of that. Oh, I'm not so, stopping, Ralph. Yeah. Um, uh, that's what I and, and, and Hal, and Hal, if you're kind enough, please give your old, call, oh, give your old friend Bloom a call. Or Blum, hey. however you pronounce it. Blum. <laughs> I'm amazed that he wouldn't write this. I, I, the truth you know, I, I should, I should Are correct Are talking myself. about Harry Bloom? We're, 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 we're speaking uh, about Ronald. Okay, oh, I Ronald don't know him. Bloom. Okay, I know you, Barry Bloom okay. would be oh, a person oh. that would write about Bloom. this. I, I, I should say one thing. In the original April 21st story that Ronald filed about this issue, which of course came came off press releases largely, from from Bud Selig's office and and um, and Players Association's office, it was only because I I'll use the word obnoxiously bothered him with emails and phone calls that he inserted a tiny tiny after the fact paragraph from me quoting me as saying you know Doug Gladstone is a uh, is a retiree's advocate, and while not overly thrilled with the deal, um, he did say it's better than something. And that's the last time I've heard from Ronald. Hmm. Right. Hey, I'm just going to – you're an advocate. Advocate this. I'm on Social Security. I pay $100 a month for Part 2 Medicare, and I make X amount of money, which – is very, very little. I'm not complaining about that because I lived a life of recreation, not work. But if I were making, say, the maximum amount 
amount in Social Security, I'd pay $100 a month for Part 2 in Medicare, the same as somebody who makes a little bit of money with Social Security. That's an inequity right there. We both have the same uh, life expectancy. We both have the, you know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of things in pensions and, and what have you. Yours is right up there with that. Not fair. That's it. Peter Goldenbach's words. I, I want to leave you gentlemen and your listening audience with one thing that, that Tony Clark said. It wasn't about this issue. It was about when he was given the Jackie Robinson Lifetime Achievement Award from the Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City uh, last June. Now, remember, we're talking Jackie Robinson, uh, the, the greatest, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, um, uh, pioneers of, of social uh, rights that, that there are. Okay? Right. And Mr. The true grandfather Clark, of civil rights, as Martin correct. Luther King said. Uh, Mr. Clark referenced a quote from the late Muhammad Ali, and he said, this is on the record, I'm not making this up, success is what you achieve, your significance is what you leave. Well, you know what? Leave these guys something of great significance, and that will be a heck of an achievement. And that would be a feather in the man's cap, and him not seeing that, um, and we didn't, I, I think he's a black gentleman. Am yes, I he is. Yes, he is. Okay, yeah. Um, I didn't. I wasn't a hundred percent sure of that. I think that makes that um, his statement. Um, I mean, his actions much more deplorable. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Your words, not mine. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my words. Well, what can I tell you? That's one of the advantages of uh, podcast radio. You can say what you want. Not indebted to stuff. Get an MLB, uh, their network and what have you. You're going to have short little cuts. You're not going to be able to elaborate. You're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to hear the tone in your voice. They're going to cut you off for commercials. Um, we got to do it a di- different way. We got to keep, t- get a different approach. We'll brainstorm on this, Doug, and we'll, we'll get something going. But I, from my standpoint, I'm going to continue to bring it up on as many shows as possible, make our all of our podcasters aware of it, and uh, talk to the players who are affected. I think um, I've had Carmen on the network uh, once with you a couple of weeks ago, once um, six or seven months ago, and um, you hear his voice. It makes a big difference. You hear the tone of a human being's voice. Uh, relating these stories, it makes it, it makes much more of a difference than just the cold facts. Um, and again, uh, how you you put it, uh, the same way Peter did. It's a matter of equity. It's a matter of um, do the right thing. The right thing. Exactly. As simple as that. Do the right thing. Yeah. And, Al George, uh, I thank you for spending this time with Ralph and myself. I really appreciate it. It was very interesting, Doug, and, and I wish you well. I think you've uh, really hit upon a, quite a subject, and I, I know that I've learned a lot, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what kind of results happen. Thank you very much. Beautiful. And Good we'll luck. talk about this on the Washington show uh, someday. That's a, um, another show on our network that George plays an integral part in. And um, I'm just going to thank you for being here, Doug. Thank you, Hal and George, for um, your continued uh, friendship and um, devotion to the station. I'm, I'm thrilled with all of this. Everybody out there, keep on keeping on. Doug, keep coming back, and um, we enjoy you uh, immensely. Next week, Thank you, everybody. We'll, Good night. Next Thank week, you, we have Jerry Casale on, who's... Uh, Recovering from the Florida flood, um, uh, hope, hopefully he'll be be in good enough shape to talk about player agents. And um, I know George has dealt with player agents in his his career as an athletic shoe salesperson or a marketer. And um, we'll have some interesting stories then. 
Till then, uh, Comfortably Zone Radio Network, this is Talking Vintage Sports from Needix at the Garden on 48th Street. Nice memory. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, all. Thank you.